seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of Inside Pacer Nation. I'm Marcus Johnson, joined this time by SID of USC Aiken, Brent Hager. Brent, welcome. <laughs> Good to be here. <laughs> And normally we have Jordan here, but sadly he could not make it today. He had prior engagements, so Brent's graciously filling in. Should be a good show anyway. Not sure about graciously, but I'm here, and, and Jordan will be back on the broadcast Friday night. Indeed he will. So we're going to start things off uh, going to golf, which always a good thing for USC Aiken to, to have a, a golf team that we have. Um, 11th PBC Championship. They just wrapped that up, earning the number four seed in the upcoming NCAA Southeast Regional. And- Arguably the toughest region in the country. We got about 15 of the 20 teams are nationally ranked. It's pretty tough to get out there because only five schools are going to get to the NCAA championship. Right now, USC is number 12 nationally, but big win this past time. It was the first win of any kind in the tournament this year. Last time they ended up not winning all season long and then won a conference championship was 2004, which was, of course, their first national championship run. So maybe, you know, history repeats itself. I mean, I'm certainly hoping so. It would be really nice to see a, a national championship come in while I've been here. Their last national championship was 2006, Correct. which was the year before I moved down to Aiken. So it would be pretty nice to see a local team bring home uh, another another nice trophy to put in that trophy case. Absolutely. I mean, and they have a chance to do it with the, the five Toronto players they have right now. If they're hot, they can beat anybody in the country. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this golf team has just always been a absolute joy to to have at the, on campus because no matter how the other sports seem to do, golf usually comes through. Then they'll pull out a conference championship every other year, it seems, and go off to the NCAA tournament and, and perform really well. So it's just it's just absolutely wonderful. And, you know, stayed nationally ranked all year long. They went from top ten to sixteen and battle back up to number twelve. And that's the one thing you can see about this team is they're consistent across the board. They have great student athletes. Last year they had the highest. GPA nationally in, in the country. Um, you got the golf national, uh, national championship for academics. They won't want to have it, one on the on the links instead. But the student athletes. The good thing about this coming week, they're done with finals right now. So you talk to uh, Axel August. They're like, well, we have a final coming up. We have to study for this, study for this, and st- they study all day long. Their grades are so good. But now they have to worry about that. They can go out there and play golf. So I think you're going to see an even better team right now than when the the team that won the conference championship a couple weeks ago. And this, this is the time to really start focusing on golf. And uh, now that exams, I know when I was in school, when the exams came around, all focus was on those and everything else just kind of took a back seat. But uh, now that the uh, the tournament's coming up, this is the time to focus on golf. And I mean, and I'm... I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of looking forward to this. I really I, f- I have a good feeling about golf this year. I think they may be able to to really really make a rush at it. And one of the things you were saying about them dropping out of the top ten and then b- working their way back up, they play a lot of Division One schools constantly. So it's it's not like they're playing pathetic opponents and and getting the getting the living tar beaten out of them. But you know, they're they're playing tough tough teams and. And it's not only tough teams, they play on some of the toughest courses in the country, where some of the other teams in the region may not be playing on the hardest courses and don't go against Division One teams. They might do it for a tournament or two, but we only play in two to three Division Two tournaments all year long, the rest of us against Division One uh, competition. And you play up against competition like that, you will normally thrive when you go down against other, you know, Division Two foes, but... And again, in this region, it's some of the toughest in the country, so it's going to be tough regardless. But I, I do like our chances. And so golf, golf looking good, golf looking promising. Move on into men's tennis. Wrapped up its season as the number six seed in the Southeast region, lost to number three Lander. But a uh, majority of the lineup is returning for the next season, so that's a really uh, a good uh, a good sign of things to come. Yeah, they were top 35 nationally all year long. Um, played well, even in the regional in the lost Lander. We were up in a couple sets and. Ended up getting beat, but they, the, it's the first team to five, you know, wins. We were up in the other set that didn't finish, so it really would have been five to four. And you're talking about, you know, uh, one play here or there, so to speak, and you win five to four or six to three. And this team with Antonio Sabaguera coming back, who is a Peach Belt Conference, Conference freshman in the year, he's going to be a sophomore. The future looks bright. Matias uh, the garden is coming back. You've got so many good people in the lineup. They're coming back, and I was talking to Coach Tom yesterday, and he says he has some some pretty big players coming in next year that should fill in the gaps rather well. And they do that, they could be pushing for you know not only a you know higher seed, but also a conference championship. You lose Armstrong State, which is always so dominant with the tragedy that's happening there with them closing the school or being absorbed by Georgia Southern. But you take out that that 
one loss, maybe two losses a year. You're talking about a team that can compete with anybody in the nation. They knocked off number 14, Georgia College. They knocked off a nationally ranked Augusta, which is always good when you knock off an Augusta's <laughs> team. It doesn't matter if they're ranked or not ranked. It's a great. Day. It's a great day. But you have those type of uh, wins. You can literally beat anyone in the country. The- yeah, I mean, one of the one of the trends I noticed throughout the year as we as we did these shows is they always seem to be just on the edge of being being that really dominant team, and they just couldn't seem to break through that. But yeah, if you add in the right place, uh, right right players next year, who knows what could happen? And, and you know, it's it's kind of like softball. They had so many games this year where they lost by in the seventh, sixth or seventh inning with you know people on there couldn't you know, couldn't get them in enough with say two on or two out. It's like men's tennis. They had so many close matches this year. They lose five to four, six to three. But the six to three scores last times were three set losses, and it wasn't like they were getting beat six zero, six zero. They were ten eight in the third set. And I mean, you're talking about just you know two serves go the right way. You're winning those those matches, and you have a number two or three seed in the in the region, and it's a completely different team. And again, our region it's just like golf. Our region is so tough. It's not even funny if you split up the the nine teams that make the regional, if you take the set, like the six or seven Peach Bowl schools that made the regional, put them into different uh, regions, most of those teams would come back and, and meet in the Sweet 16. That's how good this region is. Uh, well, well one, also one of the things I've noticed about this region is the Peach Bowl Conference itself. It almost seems to feed on each other. I mean, you have two Peach Bowl teams going at it. They tend to destroy each other, right. and it, it bo- uh, boosts the other teams that are out of the conference. So right. that's, that's, Peach Belt isn't a whole other monster in and of itself. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you've got some of these sports, and you got some other sports in the, in the country that are dominated by certain conferences. But in the, the southeast, the Peach Belt is really a dominant sport, especially the spring sports, because, you know, outside great weather, baseball, softball, men's women's tennis, golf. You know, what else is there? I mean, if we were a lacrosse conference, it would probably be the same thing. <laughs> I mean, hey, you never know. Maybe bring in a lacrosse team in the future. Absolutely. Be able to cover some of that. It's always a good – that's a good sport. I played uh, club club lacrosse for a little bit here. I, I didn't. I didn't ever play. <laughs> I tried to play when I was at Virginia Tech. They tried to teach me. That was a bad couple of days. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a tough sport. It's basically it's basically hockey in, in midair. Right. But I digress. <laughs> tennis, bright future ahead for tennis. So we're looking forward to them next year. And now we move on to a team that uh, – did well, you have one more? Well, let's talk about women's tennis real quick. Oh, women's, you know, okay. they, they didn't. Um, they made the conference tournament. Um, they didn't make the regionals this year, um, but they do graduate Nadine Tusiyama, who was a three-time all-conference performer. She was the first USC Aiken women's tennis player to ever become a first-team all-conference selection, which was last year. Goes out, of, you know, ends her career with, you know, some of the best wins in, in school history and, and on several top ten lists. And you know, just you know, great student. Great student athlete, you know, she's gonna be sorely missed. But again, they return a lot, of, lot of depth for next year too. So they lost a lot of those, you know, three set matches and you know, six to threes, even seven to two matches that were a lot closer than the score indicated. <laughs> next year, it's the same thing for men's tennis. They could be really, really good. Yeah, and and again, same thing with men's tennis. They they were maybe about half a step behind the men's team this year, right. and put in the right pieces, and you never know what you're gonna get. Absolutely. So men and women's tennis now looking strong for next year. So <laughs> looking forward to. Uh, possibly covering them next year and see what goes on. We will have our first ever live tennis broadcast next year. And that's good because I've uh, I've also played tennis, so I know what I'm talking about when I well, <laughs> when I go in. That's better you than me. <laughs> hey, well, you said it, not me. <laughs> and now we move on to another bright uh, a bright spot for USC Aiken baseball, earning the number two seed in the PBC tournament. Fifteen players are playing in their last home game this Saturday, their seniors, against Catawba, which that's going to be a really good matchup. They're number four in the region last I checked. USC Aiken number three in the region it's going to be uh, going to be an interesting game to finish the season off absolutely and earlier this week USCA can jump from five to three in the region after I believe it's seven straight wins right now you're looking at one of the hottest teams in the in the country right now um, I know we have some really really good teams but when USC can puts it together they're dynamic um, and I'm going to go ahead and, and mention the one kid that will arguably be pitcher of the year in Joey Benitez when he's on the mound I, I don't even watch the game because I'm just like I know what he's going to do and you see just hear the the ball hitting the mitt like it's a strike three. I mean, just so dominant and so fun to watch. It's it's very rare in the years that I've been at USCA where they've had a pitcher that can go out there on the mound and as a fan, you can just sit back and almost say, that's going to be a win. Right. And Joey Benitez is that good of a player that you can almost say. He does have a couple losses on the season, but, I mean, nobody's perfect. Well, he lost to, uh, to Mount Olive or this year, one nothing. Wild pitch was only run scored. And, you know, the other person was on, on third base, but again, you hold a dominant team like Mount Olive, who's top five nationally, and you can go up there 
with Joey Benitez, I would put him up against anybody in the country. Oh, yeah, undoubtedly. He's he's just such a good pitcher. And one of the things that's really helped, you said Pacers are on a seven-win streak. I think they've really started to – I think they've really solved the rotation mm-hmm. for this year, and this is the time to do it. You have Joey Benitez go out for the first game. You have Connor Riley come out for the next game. And you can send out Christian Aragon or – even Connor Norton for the next uh, for the next game to start off, and then bring Nick Yobi out from the bullpen <laughs> after maybe f- even even after only four innings if he really had to, and they can just close out the game because Yobi Yobi was a starter last year, and he he doesn't seem to have lost any of that mentality coming out of the bullpen, and, and it's I, I really feel like that if they stick to this rotation throughout the tournament, they could win the Peach Belt tournament. I, I'm not sure if they're going to. I mean, I don't want to. North Georgia is really tough, and so is yeah. Pembroke, and and you got some really great teams in the the tournament. But I like our chances. Oh, it's it's yeah, it's very uh, very good chances for the Pacers. I'll say this: I don't really, it, in all honesty, I don't care if we don't win the tournament, the Peach Belt tournament, and I'd be great too. I want to win the regional tournament. I want to win the national championship. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, you want to win the national championship, but let's let's take a step back and just go with the regional tournament first. Right. Well, one pitch at a time. Yeah. One, mean, exactly. You know, and the thing is, I mean, we've seen baseball get down by a few runs, and it doesn't phase them at all because you know you got 27 outs in the game, and they might fall behind two or three nothing early on. With the lineup that they have is so dynamic, one through nine, who do you, you know, who do you not pitch to? Uh, in all honesty, the only pitchers, the, the only the person that you don't want to pitch to is Mitchell Price. Right. He he is uh, he's really come on at the end of the year. His numbers, you know, normally you want to see a batter hitting around 350. Price is at about the 330 mark right now. But, but that's because he's had a, he had a, a bit of a slow uh, a little slow patch right there in the uh, beginning beginning middle of the middle of the season, and then he just came out. And, firing and he's in the top 10 in the peach belt and about 10 offensive categories right now and to coming from where we were struggling the start of the year to the top 10 already uh, that's just you know it says something about mitchell price i mean just how good he really is i mean yeah they've got that dangerous the, the first six in the order is just so dangerous with jose benilla leading things off he gets on base he's probably going to score yeah. because then you have you have mitchell price right there to drive him home niall goings has come out of nowhere this year and just done an absolutely fantastic job at the plate compared to where he was last year where he just couldn't seem to to, to string things together now he is Zach Moon is always a threat. He, he's he's been a little bit slower lately, but I mean he's got it in his bat. He's number number two on the team in home runs. Still still a very dangerous bat there. I mean they're just they're just loaded. You know you've got Brian Prayer who's the national hitter of the week. You know coming up and you know right now we've got Connor Durden back in the lineup. A little, um, some here too, and you've got so many hitters on there. You don't know who, and you got to set somebody out. Every time you you bring someone off the bench for bench hitter if you need them, and you're like, oh, this guy's only hitting like 375, not a big deal, and and it's just one of those things where some people have one or two hitters on the bench, but we have a, a bevy of, of players on the bench that can come in and get a pinch hit or go in and play, you know, three or four innings if need be, and and thrive in the field as well. Oh yeah, it was uh, speaking of Connor Durden, and also you know bringing players off the bench, he went down for a little bit there with a, with injury problems. <laughs> And Pacers didn't really seem to skip a beat, even though he was one of their hottest bats. They brought, they put Pereira in at, behind the plate, and he's pretty much uh, become the everyday catcher now. Right. So, and he was a great first baseman. And he's a pretty solid catcher too. Right. And his bats come really come alive at the right moments. And yeah. I'll, I'll tell you who surprised me this year is Luke Westerberg, and he's had a monster year um, coming from where he was last year when he transferred in. And he's a guy that, you know, it could be an all conference player. It could be. Um, you know, an all-region type player, just be, and, he, and he goes unnoticed a little bit because of the Mitchell Prices and Zach Moons and Pereira's, but he's really filled a gap, played right field, played in the infield a little bit, I think, and just just done anything that Coach Thomas needs him to, and, and he's really surprised me this year. Yeah, he's he's been a solid guy coming in there. Now going still seems to be the everyday right fielder, but Westerberg will come and give him a spell every now and again, right. and uh, you, you don't you almost don't miss goings when Westerberg comes in because his average is up there. He's one of the top on the team, even though he doesn't have as many at-bats, but he's he's been a solid performer. And, you know, if Westerberg does, you know, spell Nile. And Goings comes in as a pinch hitter. It's always a threat because if he gets a hold of the ball, it's not going to land for a couple of days. Yeah, there were there were a couple of shots that I'm pretty sure are still up there in orbit somewhere. Right. But, ba- but baseball coming down the stretch, they're looking really good, really sharp, and hey, you know, I'd love to see a few more trophies out there in the trophy case. We'll see how things go as the season continues. But that about wraps things up here for this episode of Inside Pacer Nation. We'll be back again, giving you more in a couple of weeks, giving you the rest of sports in their postseason see how the golf team and baseball team fare as time goes on but for brent hager i'm marcus johnson thank you for joining us and have a good one